Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. You're always there, and we just pray that we may understand how it is that you never fail us. We pray that we may understand your kingdom in such a way that we really want to live the way you are. We thank you, Lord, that you're preparing us. It takes considerable work, it seems. Help us to understand it, to really give our heart. We thank you that you're patient and that you're drawing us along. Help us not to resist, but may we see where our joy really is. Help us now to understand what Jude is telling us. May we sense the power of the fact that you told us before it came what's happening. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We are now at Jude 20. And after having dealt with apostasy, the way he has at such length and depth here, although it's a short epistle, he's really covered the ground. Now he moves into that place talking to us as the, the church of God. Verse 20, it says, But you, beloved, but you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Fantastic couple of verses there. He has called Christians, not apostates, he has called Christians, beloved, the beloved. And he said something here that should really <clears throat> make us pause to think. He said, build yourself up. <laughs> See that? They didn't say just come into the church and believe, say you believe. And that's the end of it. He said, build up the work of God, is what he's really saying. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We know that. Jesus is the only merit. He's the only salvation. But people somehow get the idea, because Jesus did everything in the way of merit, they can let him do everything else too. And really, the Bible doesn't say that any place. Here, Jude is saying something very particular. He's saying, I just showed you what apostates are, what they look like, what they do, how you can recognize them. But you, beloved, build up. <laughs> That's the opposite of apostasy. Build up the work of God. And he's, big, he's hitting us here with a wonderful thought. Instead of ungodliness, Instead of separation, instead of sensuality, we see faith. We see love and we see mercy in people. The church, the church of God. And those are big words. I mean, you can spend a long time just thinking about those and getting to the bottom of what the Bible means by these words. Faith, it never means just believe something. Never. The faith that the Bible's talking about is in Jesus Christ to trust him to do what he said and to believe. It's a, it's a done fact. <laughs> faith in Jesus Christ. Love, the kind of love that God has. We talked about that for several weeks, agape love. That's not what we feel. That's not wishy-washy. It's, it's what God does. It's how he lives. It's what comes from him. When we get God's love, we have his in us. We're not doing something by ourselves. We don't have it to work with. <laughs> we are selfish by ourselves. 
And so when love operates in us, it's the love of God himself. And there's only one kind of love that that is. There's not three or four different kinds he does. <laughs> he only loves one way. And then mercy, what a word that is. <laughs> yeah. That's what we want to understand. Where is he going today with this? He has called us beloved. Well, he began by saying, Contend, verse 3, for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. And please read it that way when you read it. In the King James it says, which was once delivered. Well, that sounds like a point of time. No, that's not really what it's saying. It's saying which was once and for all. That's never going to change. <laughs> what was delivered is always. And that's the way the book of Revelation says it. It says the everlasting gospel. Adam was saved the same way the last person on this earth is going to be saved. There's only one gospel. Modern apostasy says there's two. There's an Old Testament way and there's a New Testament way. Well, wait a minute. <coughs> that's almost as bad as what Marcion did making two gods. A bad god and a good god. Two different ways to be saved. That doesn't make sense. Contending for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. You can't do that unless you are building up the holy faith in yourself. It's impossible to contend for the faith. If you just came in and kind of thought that's nice, that's a gift, and then you never did anything else. What Jude is telling us here, it's not enough for you to believe in grace. Grace has to do something in you. God has to do a work. Now, I don't think we have a problem understanding that, that God works. <laughs> if people get all hung up about works, okay, let them get all hung up. But God does work. He does something. And when He does something... It works. <laughs> See, this is why we want the faith of Jesus. Because his faith works. <laughs> when we get his faith, the way he has faith, the kind of faith he has, then we're going to know what God has done is ample. It's sufficient. <laughs> it does everything it says. That's real faith in Jesus Christ. It's not a faith that says, oh, I hope to go, I go to heaven. Well, forget it. That's not, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> that's nowhere except in the flesh. What Jude is telling us here is we as Christians, not apostates, that we as Christians are to construct a spiritual house. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen anybody ever build a house without tools. <laughs> you have to have some pretty good tools. I've tried to make some things without tools, and let me tell you, it doesn't happen. <laughs> you can't get a razor blade and start cutting sheet rock. <laughs> <laughs> and think you're going to get anything done. You have to have the tools. Oh, the day I discovered power saws. <laughs> I said, here I've been doing it with this little saw. <laughs> no way. You have to have the right tools. God has the tools to construct a spiritual house. You can't contend without building. And you aren't going to do much good building without contending. You, they go together. That's what Jude has done. He has begun at one end and then finished at the other end saying both of them. You have to have both of them or you're going to be out of balance. Have you ever noticed yourself getting a little out of balance? It happens, doesn't it? We start telling everybody in the church how to get perfect. 
Well, wait a minute. What are you doing? <laughs> Another time you're so much into grace, you don't say anything to anybody about anything. <laughs> no, that's out of balance. The Christian that Jude is talking to has both sides of this together, working so that you're in balance. All right, so we want to look at what he's doing here. Let's look at the first element of what he's saying. To build up your faith, to be this spiritual house. Matthew 16, 18. Jesus talking to us here. Verse 18, it says, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter. All right, we remember it now. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the word there, of course, is Hades. The grave is not going to go do anything to the church. You can go ahead and go into the grave. It doesn't stop the church one little bit. But he says there he's going to build his church. And of course he's talking about the faith in him that makes it happen. He's not talking about Peter at all. Peter had that kind of faith. And he's using him as an example there. His church. Ephesians 2.20. I guess we need verse 19 for context. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation. Ah, there he is. Built. Jude says to build yourself up, but we can only do it one way. That's on the foundation. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's what holds it all up. That's what he means. It's all holding it all up. So, the Bible is quite clear. That God expects his church to be built up. It's to be built upon a foundation and a cornerstone, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.5 Now, I'm going through this because before Jude said that God's going to keep you. You are kept. But now he's saying keep yourself. And we want to see that when God says something to us in his word, he's not contradicting himself. He's showing us how it works all put together. You just don't have one piece of it. God's not going to keep us if we don't do something. Okay? So both sides have to be there. God does something. We do something. His is always the initiative. His is always the power. Ours in an, is in a happy, willing response. And that's the key. Happy, willing. When we do something just because it's the only way we're going to get to heaven, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> because God's not interested in any of us just doing what he said. It's where the heart is. Where's the motivation? Why are you doing this? 1 Peter 2.5 You also are lively stone. Have you ever seen a lively stone? What's a lively stone anyhow? It took me a long time to get a picture of it in my head. I like I like to know what's being said, and I wasn't getting anything here. Lively stone is something that has life in it. And you can see light coming out of it. <laughs> see, a lively stone. We are lively stones. We're not dead rocks. There's light coming out of us. All right, it says you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. There it is. A spiritual house. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Oh, that's a mouthful there. 
That is just a mouthful. Living stones. We can't get there by ourselves. We're dead stones by ourselves. So we have to have life in us, the life of Jesus. The light's there, living stones. Well, maybe we should look at another one here. Second Peter 1, verse 5. Very familiar scripture. Verse 5. You've got your foundation, okay? And that foundation is based on faith in Christ. What he said he's going to do and what we believe he is doing. Besides all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. All right, so faith isn't everything. <laughs> okay? But notice the word. I really appreciate that Peter put the word in there. Diligence. D nothing lazy about this. Nothing laid back about this. Nothing, hey, let God do it. Diligence. It's not saying here, oh God, will you be diligent? <laughs> this is about me. <laughs> See? My diligence. You mean to say I need to be diligent? I need to do something? Is it that works? Well, you better believe it's works. If a Christian doesn't have works, I don't believe he's a Christian. You can't have just grace. You can't have just faith. <laughs> it's not possible. It's, trying, it's like trying to buy a piece of window and just getting one side. You don't get the other side. I mean, we're in here. We're not using the outside, are we? We don't need it. <laughs> but try to buy a window without the outside. If you went to a window shop and you said that to a window man, said, just tell me the inside, I never use the outside, what would he think about you? <laughs> and yet people listen to that in sermons all the time. Yeah. Oh, I just want grace. I don't need works. No works. That's never going to happen. Just grace. That is beyond me. <laughs> that's, just, that's the kindest way I could say it. Now, I can understand how somebody could listen to that all the time and kind of think, since everybody else is saying, yeah, that's so, amen, that maybe it's so. But when a person gets off all by themselves with the good book in the Holy Spirit, I don't understand how they can get that out of it then. That throws me. So he says, besides this, giving all diligence, that's wonderful. All diligence add to your faith virtue. Well, I don't know how you can add to your faith virtue if you're going to lay down in bed and never move. I don't know how a person can do that. You've got to be doing something. And to virtue knowledge. Seems to me that's going to take an effort. To knowledge, self-control. Ah. Now, I hope you noticed where on the list that thing is. <laughs> it didn't say the minute you become a Christian, now you have complete self-control. It didn't say that. And God has never said it to anybody. But I know lots of frustrated people that think as soon as they became Christians, they had to have everything under control all the time. But they don't even know what they're controlling or why. That's why God says, after you have your faith, you're built on the foundation of Christ, you're in the kingdom through his merits, that you're not worried about those kinds of things. You're not going back to that baby milk. You're going to do solid food now. Now you add some knowledge. You find out what God knows and you get over there with him. And when you get over there with him and you understand what he's saying and some of why he's saying it and he's saying it to you, now let's go after self-control. <laughs> and that makes sense. 
I mean, how can you do something you don't even know why you're doing it? <laughs> I mean, we talk about the health message. It's very important. But do you know the health message is for Christians? God is not interested in healthy sinners. I learned that one watching people give the health message. Yeah, I saw all these gray, sallow faces. I said, man, those people could use some sunshine. <laughs> those people could use some water. What are they doing standing up there talking about the health message? The health message is important to Christians. And it's not to make you healthy. It's to get you in position where God can use you when he has to get you out of bed in the middle of the night so you won't fall apart. <laughs> He's not interested in you building muscles up so you can look at your muscles. <laughs> he wants you to be strong to help somebody. There is a true health message. For real reasons. But we need to understand some of it. And then we'll see why we're moving that way. And we will love it because we'll say, Hey, this makes perfect sense to me that God is doing it this way. Instead of saying, You mean to say I can't eat that pizza? It's got cheese on it. You know, we have a lot of people who are trying to live the health message for the wrong reasons. And they sneak that little bit of cheese to their children every now and then. When the Spirit of Prophecy says it's not fit for human consumption, and if you tell a person that, it makes them guilty instead of understanding why they shouldn't give it to their children. This is what Jude is telling us here. Spiritual. Christians not headed towards apostasy doing things from faith through knowledge through self-control and after you're practicing self-control after you're practicing self-control patience you're learning patience and if you're moving through it, now you're ready to understand the experience of godliness. You see how many people are trying to get godly first? No, it's down the list. <laughs> yeah, let's get into some of that self-control, some of that patience. Godliness. And to godliness brotherly kindness oh notice where brotherly kindness is way down there brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity that's a good word love somehow doesn't cover it all but charity gets in there charity kind of has the idea with it that you're not only loving but you don't see certain things you, you, you just don't see them you turn your eyes away and you don't notice okay. charity's big Charity doesn't hold everybody to every little thing. God can do that. He knows how to do it right, but we can't. <laughs> We're too tough on people. And you know, really, who's paying the price for that? Yeah, when we get tough with other people, we're making it hard on ourselves. <laughs> we really are. All right, so diligence to these eight steps and I really like to recall that the Bible uses numbers certain ways the number eight always means new life so the new life does this <laughs> these eight steps it's all in there so as far as we've gotten so far in this verse today we're seeing we have some responsibility we can't say, God, you do everything. Jesus did everything. Yes, he made it all possible by his life. Who he is, his merits. He earned something to give us his character, his spirit, all the things that God has promised. 
But that does not take me off the hook for responsibility. My Bible is telling me that in my life as a Christian, I am to glorify God in Christ. I'm not supposed to live for me anymore. That's the way heathen lives. That's the way lost people live. That's the way the flesh lives. My Bible says whatever you do, whether you eat or you drink or whatever you're doing, glorify God. And he didn't say just in your spirit, in your body. See? Romans 12, 1, Therefore glorify God in your body. He says, present your bodies a spiritual sacrifice. This is your worship. All right, so somehow we've crept over here into obedience. How did we do that? <laughs> and we're not talking about obeying to get saved. Obedience because you're so happy. <laughs> Isn't that the way Jesus said it in the Mount of Blessings? Makarios. Blessed is the way King James says it. But the word is, happy are you if you mourn. Happy are you if you're poor in spirit. Happy? Oh, how come I'm so happy? Because that's what happens when I'm finally smart enough to know what God is saying. And I love it. <laughs> you can't help but be happy. <laughs> We're talking here about growth in Christian character. I'm trying to say it this way because Jesus is saying it this way. He hit us with apostasy. It's so hard, all these different things we can recognize. What happens a whole person goes haywire after they became a Christian? You know, most churches teach that this person who's an apostate never really was a Christian at all. That's how they get off the hook. Because most of them believe once saved, always saved. Instead of what the Bible teaches, that we are to abide in Christ. And you can lose it if you don't abide. Yeah, somehow we got over into obedience. Oh, how did we do that? Let's go to Acts 20, 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. There it is. He's telling us how. <laughs> we want to be built up. Jude says, build up your holy faith. We're being told here how it works. Which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The word sanctified here means set apart for a holy use. That's what Peter just told us. Set apart for a holy use. Use. We are to be worked by God, and when He does that, He makes us holy. In Mount of Blessings, page 2, it says there that when Christ comes in, when we receive Jesus Christ, He first makes the heart a fit habitation for His Spirit. So before He comes, He fixes things up. <laughs> so he straightens things out so he can live there and it's okay. It's all supernatural. Now, these are some of the things we're supposed to be believing. We're not supposed to say, oh, he's going to do it someday. No. If he hasn't done it, then we're not Christians yet. <laughs> he does that to come in to make it all begin working. And so our Christian character is developing by his word, the scriptures. And if you haven't studied that lately, maybe you should look it up again sometime. Whatever your sources are, the power of God's word. Not abstract symbols, as some people teach, but actual energy source words from God. When he says something, something happens. 
This is why it's impossible for him to lie. What he says happens. And when he says to you, I receive you in Jesus Christ, guess what? <laughs> Do you think the angels wander around saying, well, I wonder if that happened? <laughs> you ever think about that? Angels don't wander around thinking things like that. They say, well, look what God said. That's it. It's true. <laughs> I think we need to get over there. <laughs> We need to start believing that when God says something, that's not. <laughs> he doesn't have to say, oh, I promise. <laughs> and we say, oh, really? Cross your fingers up to die. When God says something, that's power. And that word, power is here in his word. And that's what we are being told here in the book of Acts. I said, brethren, I commend to you God and to the word of his grace to build you up. I think you knew about this. <laughs> to build you up. Romans 10:17. Romans 10. I love to quote Paul. So many people misquote Paul. Uh, it's kind of fun to quote him back and see what they say. Romans 10, 17. So then, faith comes by hearing. And just in case you missed the thought, he says it again like a good Hebrew here. And hearing by the word of God. <laughs> okay. That's all you need to hear is the word of God. Remember Revelation? It says it seven times. He who hath an ear, let him hear. And you know, every time I think about that, I, I think of how dense I am because you know if God said something and you heard it, what else is there? <laughs> Why does God have to say it again? <laughs> or why does he even have to explain it for that matter? <laughs> if you heard it, you heard it. <laughs> it says hearing by the word of God. What's the word of God? The scripture secondarily, but it's Jesus Christ. He said, we don't want to make this abstract. Don't ever make it. You're going to become a theologian. <laughs> don't go abstract. This is talking about Jesus. When you get the power of God, you're going to get it through Jesus. When God says something, if you receive it in Christ, you have what God said. Jesus does not cut it off and say, well, I'll just give you a piece of it. You get all of the Word of God. You know, we see that when He healed people. I'm still looking, and I don't think I'm ever going to find it, where Jesus looked at somebody and says, Your faith has made you halfway. I'll do the rest later. <laughs> There's no Jesus like that in the Scriptures. We keep making up these stories. <laughs> And they're just stories because they're not in the Bible. They're not in reality. They are not truth. They're not the philosophy of God. They're not what God believes. We in our Christianity need what Judah is saying here. He says, you know, you need some building up. <laughs> you settled down too soon. You thought you knew something when you discovered grace. Well, that's a wonderful thing to know about. But grace takes you someplace. Do you know all of us are still headed there? <laughs> yeah, grace isn't going to really do its work until Jesus comes back. Because we're no place 
in the history of salvation until he comes back and we are glorified and immortalized. I have to be careful because some people already think they have immortality, but that's another strange thought to me because if you're immortal without Jesus, I don't understand the sense of it. My Bible tells me, and I haven't found anything different, that the only people who are going to be immortal are Christians. Immortal means eternal life. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. I mean, I don't want to do gymnastics with my brain and make that come out another way. I can't do that to my brain and come out ahead. Ephesians 5, 26. Dealing with marriage here as a way of understanding what the Spirit is trying to tell us. Verse 23, it says, Christ is the head of the church. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. There it is, see. The Word of God is the only thing that can do this. Don't try to cleanse yourself. You can't do it. But God can and does in Christ. By His Word. John 17, 17. Now the Bible doesn't quit at making a person a believer. There's something that happens to a believer. Believer is the first step. It's called justification by faith in the merits of Jesus alone. But that's not the whole plan of salvation. There's two seconds after that. And it says here, Jesus talking, sanctify them. Sanctify them through thy truth. That means reality. Thy word is truth. The Father and the Son always agree. Always. And that's where we're getting to. We're, we're trying to understand how to agree with the Godhead. How to think the same way God thinks about things. James 1.25 Do you want to be blessed? Everybody wants to be blessed by God. Well, there's just kind of an interesting little thing that James says here in passing. Whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty. And that word law there does not mean scripture. It means law. It means the Ten Commandments in particular. It says, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So James says here, a blessing from God, because you're not just a hearer and you're just not a sayer, but you're actually a doer. You walk. Instead of just talk. 1 John 2, 5. But whoso keepeth his word, God's word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. We have his word. That word does something. So Jude said something else. We've just been working on the first part of it here that we ought to go back and see where else he went with this. Verse 10, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Well, we, we did over 15 studies on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Praying in the Holy Ghost. Why is that? Do you remember some of that? Well, Jesus is always praying. He and the Father are always in an interchange of some sort. Jesus asked the Father, give. Jesus.
Jesus is always in prayer, ceaseless prayer. That's his life. And if we have Jesus in us, that's happening in us. What he's doing. We are in Christ. We are praying without ceasing because we are abiding in him. And whatever he asks of the Father, he receives. And so what Jude is saying here is that very thing that we were looking at. That if you're going to be building yourself up the most holy faith, you will always be praying in the Holy Spirit. That is the Spirit of Christ as he prays. And so this is part of that character development that comes from having the mind of Christ. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians. He says, we have the mind of Christ. And then in Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. We are to have the attitude of Christ. His mind, the way he thinks. In that posture, when we pray, because we are in the Spirit, we are in heavenly places with Christ. Ephesians, the first chapter. And when we pray, we are praying in the counsels of the Godhead. <laughs> God is not making any decisions without us being part of it in prayer. <laughs> That's right. We are in the counsels of the Godhead. That's what prayer does with us. And so we receive the promises of Christ. And because of that, we know how to live a life of petition and praise and thanksgiving. Because that's what we have in our hearts. Now, I want to remind you once more. You don't need reminding, but I'm going to remind you. Anyhow, we are entering a time of the year. <laughs> That's different. At least for Americans. I don't know around the world. But for Americans, it's different. Something happens this time of the year to Americans. Somehow, they open up a little more. They, they say, hello, more. They they uh, wish you good morning as you're walking. Things happen this time of the year. It's beginning to happen already. The, the fall season, the leaves falling, the signals are coming out. Oh, what's that time again? <laughs> you get a little friendlier. This is a tremendous time to do some missionary work and know that Something's going to be a little different now during this time of the year. You're going to be able to talk to people you hadn't talked to all year. You're even going to be able to talk to your relatives in a way you haven't because they're already thinking about presents. <laughs> you can get people who would never read anything. You can even give them a book and they'll take it. <laughs> Just be sure to wrap it. <laughs> thanksgiving in people. They begin to think about it. And it makes a difference, in a difference in how they relate to things and people. So we're moving into a good time of the year to approach the heart for Jesus Christ. And if we have enough time, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that, what God does during this time of the year especially. Let's just see. So he says, Praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourself in the love of God. Now, that statement can be misunderstood. Some people think that that maybe means that you're going to work real hard about continually loving God so you do the right thing. That's not what it's saying at all. Jude has spent too much time here telling us about something else to get us over in that side of our thinking. What he's saying to keep Keep yourself in the love of God. 
He's saying you stay where God's blessings can keep showering you, where they can keep coming to you. Don't do things that will pull you away from that. And so here's his first of some real interesting warnings. He's saying that it's possible for us to pull away. <laughs> there are a lot of people who don't believe that. They, 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 some of them say, that, oh, you're still going to go to heaven. It's just, you just won't be as comfortable there. Well, big deal. <laughs> you know, just won't be as comfortable there. Well, some people believe that. I don't see it in the scriptures. He says here, keep yourselves in the love of God. John 15, 9. This is Jesus himself talking. I can't think of a better place to go to find out what Jude is really saying. As the Father hath loved me, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Continue ye in my love. There he said it point blank, to stay where God can bless you. Continue in the way Jesus loves you. Do I dare read that next verse? Do I dare read that verse? If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. This seems to me like keeping the commandments is part of the process in there. Loyalty and love, obedience. You know, this is so common sense to me. I, I just wonder how the theologians got a hold of people. Of course, that's what Jude is telling us. That's what they would do, the false teachers. That's what this whole epistle is about. But over there in uh, the story of the prodigal son, everybody knows that story. I mean, the son was at home being blessed by the father. When did the father have to stop blessing that son? Oh, man, you don't have to be a genius to see this. <laughs> you don't have to be a high spiritual ensemble or whatever. It's right there as plain as day. When he left the father by his own choices and did things over there, the father couldn't bless him while he was doing that. What did the boy have to do? He had to get back there where the Father could bless him, to abide under who he was. The Father wanted to bless him the whole time. The Father loved him. But he couldn't bless him over there with those people that were having parties. Well, let's see here. Galatians 5, 6. I thought about that one this morning. That scripture, I haven't heard too many sermons on it, but it's a tremendous, tremendous scripture. Galatians 5, verse 6. Yeah, in Galatians 5, 6, it says, For in Jesus Christ. See, in Jesus Christ. Not about Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. Circumcision doesn't avail anything. Belonging to that particular church at that time, doesn't mean anything, nor uncircumcision. So it doesn't make any difference one way or the other. So don't be making big stories about they did everything wrong. No, he says it doesn't matter. And we do everything right. No, it doesn't matter. Circumcision or uncircumcision, it doesn't avail. But faith over there or over here, faith which works. <laughs> Not faith by itself. The Bible never says it. Faith that works by life. And that can only come 
from God. You see, that's agape love. Faith that works by love. Jude said, keep yourself in the love of God. Don't remove yourself from there. Abide in Jesus Christ. Have faith that works by love. And let's add that whole thought. Faith that works by love and purifies the soul. See? Is it any wonder there is such a struggle going on in the churches everywhere around the world of people becoming pure? Well, God can only do one way. In Christ, faith that works by love and purifies the soul. All right, we're closing in on this. We better finish up this, at least this verse today. Looking for, he said. Oh, well, let's go back there, Jude. But ye, beloved, building up yourself the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Looking, looking for it. Is that all I'm supposed to be doing is looking for? That particular word here in Jude is not too difficult to track down. Luke uses it. In uh, Luke, the 12th chapter, let's see how he uses that, that same word. 1236. In verse 35, it says, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. Okay, wait. There's the word. Jude tells us to look. Be looking. And that word means to wait. Titus 2.13 says the same thing. It deals with eager anticipation. It's talking about His coming. Jesus is coming. It's the whole focus of your life that Jesus is coming. What's He coming with? Well, over there in Hebrews, it said he's coming with salvation, this time without sin. <laughs> no sin problem. This time it's full redemption. It's complete. Mercy has fulfilled what it was supposed to do. Jesus is coming with that redemption. Okay, we have a few minutes here. I want to get over there to verses 22 to 23. Let's do that. Um, I'll try to move through this a little more in a straightforward way. Jude 22. He says, Now you people who have received mercy, and you know what mercy is, and you're happy, and you understand what obedience is. It's a loving response. It's between you and God, and you enjoy that. Verse 22. Of some have compassion, make a difference. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. All of a sudden, he moves off into evangelism. <laughs> Missionary work. And it's absolutely logical, his sequence here. He has just talked to the beloved. They know about mercy. They know what salvation is about. They know about building up their holy faith. They are contending for the faith once delivered, once and for all, to the saints. And it says they are to build up that same holy faith. And now he's telling Christians, every Christian born into the kingdom of God is born as a missionary. <laughs> it's not possible. To become a Christian in Jesus Christ, in the Spirit, without wanting to help somebody else too. Because you see how lost you were now. And you see how lost they are. And you can't stand it. When we have built up the most holy faith in ourselves, it's got to go out. <laughs> That's why you can't have just one part of this. Any other part is just selfish salvation for, a, for themselves. 
The other way is real from God and it has to go out. That's what he did it for. It's for everybody. Anybody who will. Jesus said over and over again, whosoever will. So what we have done for ourselves, now we are doing for others. It's going to come out. You will be a soul winner. Personal work. And Jude here lists three different areas. So we'll understand how to do this. Number one, he talks about a group of people we will talk to in a certain compassionate, tender way. Because these people have some doubts, and they are sincere doubts. There are things they just don't know about, and you've got to deal with them very tenderly and carefully. The second group. He says you have to deal with them in different ways, with boldness. You just snatch them from the fire. <laughs> okay. And we'll talk about that for just a few minutes here to see what that means, to pull them out of the fire. And then the third one, one perhaps we may not be so familiar with, he says this one you be careful with. You do this with fear, with caution, because... You may not recognize it at first, but there is a possibility of contamination here. Yeah. Soul winning and getting contaminated? Oh, we need to know that. All right, so let's look at that first one. Matthew 5, 7, Jesus, he talks about mercy. And the, the children of God, of course, know they have received that mercy. 5, 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. That's an interesting way to say that, isn't it? Those who are merciful receive mercy. It kind of reminds one of what Elsie said about forgiveness. The way you forgive is the way you're going to get forgiven. You know, I used to wonder about those kinds of things. They seemed a little bit backwards to me. You have to get something first, and then you can do something. But no, he's, he's saying here to tell us that God has a standard of fairness. It's not his. It's yours. What you think is fair, he's going to use on you. <laughs> it's what you did with other people. <laughs> That's where that word hypocrite comes from. Why, you play actor? You want to be that way with people, but you don't want God to be that way with you? <laughs> That's bad. When I first discovered that, I was reading through a little book. And it says, you know, this, this thing about judging lest you be judged, I said, that really doesn't mean it at all, uh, judging. Because you judge, you're not only worse than the person you're judging. <laughs> you do the same things they do, and on top of that, you add to it the sin of being a censor. <laughs> and God says, what you do is fair for you. He's going to do it. You do it to you. <laughs> and when I first got a hold of that I just <laughs> well, I said I can't think of anything worse than God judging everybody me by the way I looked at everybody else <laughs> I need some mercy <laughs> oh that is really bad news so Jesus says it here the merciful We'll receive mercy. That's fair. <laughs> so, if I have received mercy, and I know I have received mercy, I mean, by all rights, that's all I can give out. <laughs> Remember that householder and the money he lent and all that? He told him to use it in certain ways. And the one 
just buried it because he thought if I do anything else, I'm really taking a risk. This guy's a hard guy. He's tough. If I lose it, I'm going to really be in trouble. She said, I'm not going to lose it. I'll just give it back to him. <laughs> and that's what he did. He gave it back. What a useless guy. Anybody could have done that. But he did that because he thought the master was a hard person. Thing. And that's the way some people think about God. Oh, man, I'm going to have to tow this line. i got to do this. i got to do that. He's hard. Ooh. And that's what Jesus was saying. How can you think of your father as being hard like that? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Having received the Christian wants to give. That's all I can do. Just give. Let's get that mercy out there where people can see it and understand that this is the ultimate hope. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. And that's where we're really going to see mercy happening. <laughs> we're going to get to go home. Happy. That's what he says. Happy. Happy. Mercy to the lost. Well, the word that Jude used over there, too, was doubt. Maybe we should look at that word for a second. Matthew 14, 31. We're, we're not far from there, so we'll just go there. You know, we're back to Peter again. Peter was exercising some faith. He said, oh, let me walk out there. And Jesus said, okay, come on. <laughs> and Peter got out of the water. Can you imagine that? He was walking on the water. And he was having a good time. Now that's faith that works. Now, he got over into faith that doesn't work. Oh, grace by itself with nothing else. And you know what happened to him. Right down in the water, and in the, he's hollering immediately, Oh, Lord, save me, save me. So what did Jesus do? Verse 31, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. Why did you doubt? Oh, little faith. <laughs> That's what he called him, oh, little faith. Why did you doubt? But you know what Jesus did there? That's what we want to look at. This is what Jude is telling us. You stick out your hand. Somebody's going down. Stick out your hand. Help them. They're hollering to God for help. You put out your hand. So Jude's telling us some beautiful things here. That particular section in Jude, I don't want to get you over into theology, but many of the commentators have a secondary reading in the Greek. They're not too sure how the Greek really goes there. And I really favor that second reading a little bit. I'll tell you what that second reading really comes out. It says, refute those that dispute with you. That's what Jude is saying. Yeah. Refute those now, that doesn't mean argue with him. <laughs> it's too easy for us to get up in the flesh and start arguing with people and try to be logical and all the rest of it. No, what he's saying, refute here, is he's saying, you in the power of the Spirit of Christ say the truth and bring conviction to them that what they believe is in opposition to the Word. Now, that's a real challenge, that we are to dispute with people without becoming a nuisance or obnoxious. We are to give an answer. Isn't that what Peter said? We are to give an answer to anyone who's, who's listening. You don't want to argue with people if they don't want to hear. That's that. Don't, don't stir things up. But we are not to stand by and not know what's going on. We are to be prepared to demonstrate the falsity of opposition. So in the few minutes that uh, remain here, we'll just do this particular part of the verse. We are to keep in the love of God, to pray in the Spirit, 
to build up the holy faith. And the word in our hands, you have to believe this, the word in our hands, as we are doing what the Bible says to do, as Jude is saying to do, the word will be a hammer in our hands. That's what God says over there in Jeremiah. It's not my word like a hammer. There is a power there. We must not think because of that person's incapacity or my inability to communicate, we're never going to get anything done here. Now, this is God's work. His word has power. It does things we don't understand. He has invested in the plan of salvation. He's going to get it done. He says, you rebuke, you convict, and I will convert. He will convert people. If you didn't even think it was possible, in the power of his spirit, they must make the choices. Okay, that's all I'm going to do. I don't want to start in another section today because it gets pretty heavy at the end. We're right at the end of what Jude is doing before that benediction. So we'll save it for next week. We will uh, finish up the actual epistle next next time. All right, let's have prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Although it comes through men, they have been inspired with the thoughts. They have chosen their words. Help us, Lord, to get through the cultural situations of times past in language and hear your spirit speaking to us we thank you that we're not doing something from afar you are within us you are touching our heart you are helping us to come to the place of knowledge so that we can make intelligent decisions help us Lord to see these decisions through. We're just flesh. But in Jesus, we have the power we need. Help us, Lord, not to make excuses. Instead, let us truly be on our knees and agonizing to know what it is experientially to be sanctified. We thank you that you do not know failure, that you are preparing us for that second coming where we can lift our heads and know he will save us. We thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen.